So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank Ono Academic College and Professor Siegel for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Natasha Pereira Schiemann, and I'm a litigator at Asterson Law Offices where I handle US and UK disputes. Uh, I want to apologize for not being able to do this in Hebrew, but I'm only in week three of Ulpan, so they have not taught me how to do this uh, in Hebrew yet. So the US Supreme Court in Dobbs has unleashed, I think, what we've heard today, like an immense chaos in the United States. And while the immediate matter is making it, that the decision makes it very complicated for women who are seeking access to abortion, it has also placed the states themselves in a very precarious position, with lawmakers responding to the court's decision in very intense and conflicting ways. So one thing we need to remember, and I believe the Dean spoke about it earlier today, is that the Dobbs decision does not actually prohibit or ban abortion in itself. What it does is that it gives the regulation of abortion, including whether or not it should be criminalized, back to the states um, and for them to then go ahead and regulate. So this allocation of certain powers to the states is a hallmark of American federalism and protected by the US Constitution's 10th Amendment, which basically says anything that's not reserved to the federal government will be sent to the states. So for example, you can think about the authority to make money, the authority to regulate um, commerce and declare war. These are all things that are specifically given to the federal government, and it makes sense. Um, you wouldn't want different policies across the states for these things. Now, Roe v. Wade, in Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court essentially took away the power of the states to criminalize abortions. By finding that a woman had a constitutional right to decide to terminate her pregnancy, the Roe Court legalized abortions throughout the country. So this established a national standard that the states could not deviate from. This does not mean that the states were cut out entirely, however, um, and they did very strictly regulate, often really pushing the limits um, of the regulations that they were putting within their states. Um, but ultimately, they weren't able to ban it because of Roe. Um, but now through Dobbs, the Supreme Court has returned the full scope of abortion policymaking back to the states. But I think it's important to remember that it's not just a simple like restitution of states' complete autonomy over abortion policymaking. The pre-Row and post-Dobbs landscape are not the same. And increasing divisiveness over abortion over the last 50 years has ensured that states in the post-Dobbs America are going to be are deeply entrenched in their position. So states have loudly drawn battle lines that either call for more severe punishment, things that are more severe than what we saw in the pre-Roe world, or zealously committing themselves to protecting that right. But in either way, the result has been a much more extreme and clashing response from the states. So let's consider the current abortion landscape after the Dobbs decision to understand exactly where the states are. So abortion has been banned, or is expected to be banned, in at least 22 states. So these are the burgundy, the red, and the orange states that you see here. 20 states have continued to legalize, um, con 22, 20 states have continued to legalize abortion, access to abortion, or have even expanded their protections. These are the light purple states. And then there are eight states, the ones in white, where lawmakers have expressed an interest in imposing further restrictions, but for now, abortions remain legal. So as you can see from the map, this essentially creates regions of abortion policy in the United States, with the coasts um, protecting the right to access abortion, and the south and uh, Midwest largely banning or severely limiting it. So while practically speaking, having different laws between the states is a core concept of American federalism, the striking and unique feature of the state abortion laws is that they seek to extend that state's authority into other states and beyond its own borders. So take, for example, the interesting case of Texas and New Mexico. So these states have radically different abortion policies, but they are right next to each other. So if we take a look at Texas, Texas has a number of laws um, that together impose almost a total ban on abortions and seek to penalize those who assist others in obtaining abortion. 
So we have two bills here listed, and it gives you the sense of the extreme restrictiveness of Texas abortion policies. There's almost no exceptions. There's no exception for rape. There's no exception for incest, just severe medical emergencies. And it's not really surprising given the deeply conservative state that Texas is. On the other side, however, we have a state like New Mexico. And New, Mexico, New Mexico's abortion policy is very broad. It imposes no limit of when a woman can terminate her pregnancy. It does not require waiting periods or the involvement of parents uh, for teenagers seeking abortion. And it also allows abortion services to be covered um, by the, the public health care. Um, by the public health care plan. So this is all really great news if you're a woman living in New Mexico. Um, if you should need abortion services, then those are going to be available to you in your state. But what about the woman that's in Texas? As you would expect, Texas's ban on abortion will not end the practice. It will just force women to travel out of state to obtain the reproductive services that they need. With the ease of interstate travel, especially between bordering states, it's expected that New Mexico's clinics will see a stark increase in rise from out-of-state patients. Now the question is, how will Texas respond when its residents inevitably go to New Mexico to obtain abortion services and then return back to Texas? Or what will happen to those that assist or provide funding um, to, in, for interstate travel? Or the doctors and medical professionals who perform abortions in New Mexico but maybe travel through or live in Texas? So these questions underscore the great tension that will percolate between the states, especially when the states are bordering each other. And with the stage set for immense interstate conflict, the central question will be how far are restrictive states willing to go to enforce their bans? So I think here a look at the marijuana policy may give us some insight into what we can expect with abortion. Like abortions, the criminalization of marijuana is a decision that is rele relegated to the states. So naturally, different states have different positions, and this becomes particularly interesting where we have clashing, state, um, clashing states that are next to each other. So for example, if you look here, Colorado fully legalizes marijuana, but the state right next to it, Kansas, it remains entirely illegal. So this mismatch of criminalization and close geographic proximity predictably leads to interstate conflict as the state seeks to enforce its law. Um, so for example, we see here the police regularly pull people over in Texas who are suspected of possessing marijuana. This leads to issues with the police uh, profiling cars with Colorado license plates. And we've even seen expansive enforcement efforts like confiscating the sales of proceeds for marijuana that are being driven through the state. So not even the drug itself, just the proceeds. So it is conceivable that we could see a similar situation with abortion. The police waiting on the state borders ready to detain people as they travel into a restrictive state. But unlike marijuana, which can be detected on sight or smell, it is impossible to screen travelers who may be seeking, delivering, or assisting out-of-state abortion services. The enforcement challenge that restrictive states will face is a real hurdle. But I think it would be naive to believe that this obstacle will deter them from advancing their policies. As we have seen over the past 50 years, anti-abortion advocates are not afraid to push the limits of the existing laws, and they are creative in finding ways to work around the legal or practical challenges to advance their policy preferences. Probably most importantly, these states and their lawmakers are extremely determined to end abortion practice in the United States, and they will not cower now that they have a victory in Dobbs. So protective states like New Mexico have anticipated this and are putting in place laws that protect healthcare providers from discipline for providing abortions to out-of-state residents, rejecting extradition attempts, and even prohibiting state agencies from assisting other states from investigating violations. It is clear that the Dobbs decision has opened a Pandora's box on what lengths states can go to to advance um, the consequence, like what they can do to advance the consequences of their law, and how do those consequences then infringe or possibly infringe on the other states' right to enforce their conflicting policy. So at the moment, the laws are all over the map on abortion, which we can see. One thing is very clear. We are in for a very long, interstate legal battle, which will have implications on the scope of state power that extends beyond abortion policy. Thank you.